Let's give our confession of faith. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. May all our believers overseas as well give this confession together. Christ means the solution to all problems. Today's message is entitled, The Faith That Jesus Desires. The word, the book of Mark that we've been looking at each week and the other gospel books tells us that there's something that Jesus desires from us. And what is it that Jesus desires from us? That is faith. When Jesus did his public ministry, he performed many ministries, many and miracles, and he healed sicknesses that were incurable. But there's one thing that he said in all of that, and that was faith. He always emphasized faith. After the healing of the bleeding woman that we looked at last week, when he, Jesus healed that woman, Jesus said to that woman, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. What is that faith? The faith that believed that even if she was to hold on to Jesus' cloth, do you have that faith? It was not about Jesus laying his hands on her or praying on her, but she believed that even, even his cloth would have power. How could clo a cloth, a piece of cloth, have power? But because Jesus wore that cloth, she believed that even if she would just touch the cloth, that her sickness would be healed. That's what Jesus looked at. Of course, asking for Jesus to lay his hands on her would have been faith as well, but she had the faith that if she just simply touched the cloth of Jesus, she would be healed. It was that faith. God, give me a faith of that cloth. Even if I was to touch that cloth, that this incurable disease would be disease, would be healed. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. What was revealed outwardly was her healing. However, what was in the background of that healing, it was faith. Why is that person so prosperous? Why is it that so, that person is used so well? Why is, that, why is it that that one individual is so rich and all things work out very well? Do not only look at what is revealed outwardly, but look at the faith that is in the background of that. When we look at Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 41 that we looked last time, the instant of the windstorm, even through that, Jesus mentioned the disciples' faith. To the disciples that were trembling in fear, this is what Jesus said, Have you still no faith? There was a great windstorm, and the problem is not our boat would sink. It was not the windstorm that was the problem. But what is important is that have you still no faith? Oh, because of this person, because of that person, because of this and that, because I'm so unlucky, because I did all the, I made these mistakes, and because, you know, I'm just, I don't have a good, good destiny. Those are all lies that you're being deceived with. Do I really have the faith that Jesus desires or not? That is what is important. The faith that confronts head on, that does not avoid, but he confronts head on. May you have that faith. Even when we look at verse 36 of today's passage, Jesus emphasizes, do not fear, only believe. There are many things we may be afraid of in our lives. There may be things that make us uncomfortable. But do not fear. Do not, do not be offended by that. Do not be discouraged by that. Only believe. This is what Jesus emphasizes. He emphasizes the importance of faith through various situations and incidents. And many people preach with the title, Do Not Fear, Only Believe. Fear and faith actually have a correlation. 
Why do people fear? Because they have no faith. So the more afraid you are, the less faith you have. And the more faith you have, the less fear you would have. There is a correlation in that. And that's why for people who are always anxious and worried in their life, it's because they lack faith. What's a characteristic of people who have faith? They are at peace. Fear and faith, they are in an inversely proportional relationship. Especially for a child of God, faith is an indispensable mandatory element. It is an absolute necessity and something that should not be absent. And it's because faith is both the starting point of a walk of faith and the vessel to receive the grace given by God. It is the vessel to receive answers. If you don't have faith, you don't have a vessel. There is no vessel to receive answers. Everyone desires to receive God's grace. However, the issue is that if you do not have this vessel of faith, you will not be able to receive answers. In order to receive answers, you must have the vessel to do so. God may enlarge the vessel of my heart, then you will receive great answers. And as you receive great answers, you will be used greatly. And it is also the same for the only way to become a child of God, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, God gave them the right to become children of God. What does it mean to receive Jesus? It means that we believe in Jesus. What does it mean to believe? What kind of belief and faith? It's not just a blind faith, but it is the faith that believes Jesus as the Christ, the solution to all things. That if I believe in Jesus, because he is the answer and solution to all problems, if I, when I believe in him, all things will be healed and restored. Why? Because he is the solution to all things. When we say all things, there is no exemption. He is the solution to all things. And so the faith that believes that He is the solution to all things, that is what the Bible emphasizes. And that is how Christianity begins with faith and ends with faith. Faith. And the world also to tosses around the word faith. And other religions also all speak of faith. Then what is important today is today's title. What is the faith that Jesus desires? What do we have to believe in? Do we believe in the church? Do we believe in the pastor? Do we believe in other church members? No, that's not what it's talking about. The faith that the Bible talks of means that we must believe in Jesus. Then what do we believe in? That He is the answer to all things. Then from the great three problems of our lives to all problems inside Christ, inside Jesus, all of that are resolved. Through the three positions of Jesus, because he has solved the problem of Satan's sin and death, everything is finished. Everything is just introductory. When we are saved from that, everything is finished. And so, if when the problem of sin has not been resolved, for unbelievers, their sins are are still they still remain in them, and they go to hell with that. They receive the consequences of that, the wages of that. What is the difference between a believer and an unbeliever is that even if they both sin, a believer, because through the blood of Jesus, we have been saved and we do not receive the wages of sin. However, but if you do not believe in Jesus because that problem of sin has not been resolved, they have to receive the wages of that sin. And that is why the problem of sin must be resolved. You can go, you go to heaven when you become a righteous one. How can a sinner go to heaven? How can you become righteous? A righteous must live only by faith. What faith? The faith that believes in Jesus Christ who died on the cross and who resurrected and who solved and cleansed all my sins. You must have the faith that believes in the forgiveness of your sins. When you look at today's passage, we see a father. He was a father whose daughter was dying and he threw everything of his own away to save his daughter. And this man was the, the ruler of the synagogue, Jairus. Last week, the woman who had lost all hope after suffering 
from her disease. She was healed after meeting Jesus. But what was the starting point of that healing? It started when she heard the news of Jesus, that Jesus heals all illnesses, that Jesus is the solution to all problems. She had heard that news. And she had the faith that, oh, if I even touch the cloth of Jesus, I will be healed. She heard the news. And even Jairus, who appears in today's passage, had never met Jesus before. He didn't know of Jesus, but he heard the news of Jesus, that Jesus solves all problems and all sicknesses. He had heard this news, and he came to Jesus. And that is why a life that spreads the news of Jesus is that important. Whether they believe it or not, you must spread the news. Because within that are those who do believe in that news. And another important point was that both of these people believed, even though they heard just the news of Jesus, they believed that Jesus would heal them. That if they met Jesus, then they would be healed. It was not like Jesus had promised them, but they heard this news and they had the faith that if they met Jesus, that they would be healed. They had the faith. Through today's word, May you all receive answers to what faith it is that Jesus desires through us and become the absolute disciples of Christ to enlarge the place of your tent within the fields of your lives. Point number one, the faith to come before Jesus. Let's look at verse 21. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great cow crowd gathered around him, and he was beside the sea. Then came out of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him, and a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. After Jesus healed the man possessed by the army of demons in the region of Gerasenes. He had gone through all the windstorm to heal that man. Then he returned back to the other side, and it was the region of Capernaum. And after hearing the news that Jesus had arrived there, a great crowd gathered once again and to effectively teach about the gospel of heaven jesus chose the sea where there it was wide enough and large enough to effectively teach all those people and at that time a person named Jairus, who was a ruler of the synagogue came to find jesus and he bowed at the feet of jesus and because his daughter was dying he asked jesus that jesus would come to lay his hands on his daughter and save her when Jesus healed the sick, he had heard that Jesus laid his hands on them. So Jairus had asked Jesus to lay his hands on his daughter. And looking at these actions of Jairus, because his daughter was dying from an unknown illness, we can assume that it is natural for Jairus to act this way. But when you look at it culturally, uh, in a cultural context at that time, the actions of Jairus were, was completely unconventional because the position as the ruler of the synagogue was a role that inflicted absolute influence on the Jews. It's, it actually symbolized the, the pride of the Jews. Why? Because when it comes to the Jews, wherever they go, they would establish synagogues. And it's still the same today. Let's say that when Jews, they and Jewish people, they immigrate somewhere, they always build up a synagogue. Even inside America, there is a, a different separate region for the Jewish people. So they had built up synagogues everywhere they went, and they all activities were centered around the synagogue. And that is why not any average person could become a ruler of the synagogue. They had to become familiar with legalism, and they had to be thoroughly devoted to Judaism. Only those individuals could become a ruler of the synagogue. And they were that was quite a high position. But he, this ruler of the synagogue had sought out Jesus, who on the outside was nothing more than a young adult. But he knelt before his feet. 
it was completely unimaginable. But that's how much desperate Jairus was. Because his daughter was dying. And that's how earnest he was. And he knelt before Jesus. Do you think Jesus didn't know that? That who he was, what kind of position he had? But from the actions of Jairus, there's something we can learn. It's that whenever we face problems that in, our, in the journey of life that seems insurmountable or that we can't understand, it's time for us to bring those problems before Jesus. Even the woman with the sickness of menorrhagia also tried every means and method available to her to try and solve the problem for 12 years, but there was no solution, and in the end, she came before Jesus, and it was the same for Jairus. He first came to Jesus, who is the solution and the answer to all problems. That's what we should focus on. It is important that he came to Jesus. As I reflect on today's passage, I reflect on myself. When I first heard the news of my son's diagnosis that he had a hearing impairment and because he couldn't hear, he couldn't speak, it felt like my, the sky was just crumbling. It was when my friend was a doctor and I asked him, can you, can you examine my son? Because I think they, I've, my son is a bit strange. And he told me, he told me, oh, your son has a hearing impairment. I said, what does that mean? And the moment I heard that he couldn't hear, I couldn't see anything. And so what do I do? Me who believes in Jesus, what could I have done? From that day on, like Jairus, with a very desperate heart, I'd go to a room and I went to, a, a, I went to church when there was no one there and I knelt before my knees and I would pray to God. And so do you think I could go to sleep at that time? I had no appetite. I didn't want to do anything. So I just, after I got off work, I just prayed desperately to God. But it was strange. It, when I, if I continued, when I continued to pray, what I should have heard was that God would heal him. But all I could hear was God telling me to evangelize. You know, most believers who are born into a Christian family, they don't evangelize. In the church that I went to at that time, it wasn't a church that evangelized. It was a very quiet church. But what God continues told me as I prayed was for me to evangelize. That was the answer Jesus gave me. And from then on, I staked my life on prayer and evangelism. There were no other thoughts. After I did my, after my job, I got off my job, I would, on the weekends, always go out in evangelism. I didn't know what that really meant, but then I'd go to YMCA. I would buy 20,000 materials from YMC and I would just scatter it all around the city of Busan. And I'd go to Busan Station where the, there'd be a lot of people there. I'd always seek out the places where a lot of people were gathered and I'd hand out all the evangelical materials. And then on, in, at Busan Station, when people got off their trains, I'd go and give it to them. And then they'd throw it out. And so then in Busan, it was very windy. And so those papers, the materials that I had handed them, would kind of be flying around. So then I'd pick it up again, and I'd hand it out again. I would do that every week. And all I did was pray and evangelize. It was a life completely opposite to what I had lived how I lived before and to my nature. I didn't have a nature of prayer and evangelism, but I staked my life on it. And what was the result of that? That is Yewon Church. From that, Yewon Church was established. And now our church is actively expanding its specialized ministries. I don't think I've heard any other church that has these, this many specialized ministries as our church. And we're embracing our mission as a healing courtyard. But the starting point of that was our Yewon Deaf Church. And following Yewon Deaf Church, various other specialized ministries have unfolded, including Dream Church, Love Church, Senior Specialized Church, Medical Missions Department, Addiction Healing, Shamanism, North Korea, Breathing Prayer, and Military Specialized Ministries, and among others. Today at 2.30 p.m., 
The 237 Deaf Church will be newly established, and I'll be delivering a message entitled, The Platform That Saves the 237 Deaf. And so, this is different from our pre-existing Deaf Church because this will be more uh, focused on the English-speaking Deaf and the multi-ethnic Deaf in Korea. And we will be building an online and offline English sign language worship system where we can also stream online so that the deaf through sign language can hear this gospel, this original gospel. And we aim to save the deaf in the 237 nations. According to the World Health Organization, WHO, About 6% of the world's population, which amounts to approximately 460 million people, have some form of hearing disability. And this statistic includes a wide range of hearing impairments, including, including those with mild to severe hearing loss. And it is estimated that the actual number of people who use sign language as their mother tongue So, deaf who use sign language as their mother tongue is about 3% of the human population, or roughly 230 million people. So, their language is sign language. And in our nation, in South Korea, there are about 350,000 people who use sign language as their primary language. And so, when we say deaf evangelism, it's not... It's not accurate because their language is, mis is sign language, so it's called deaf missions because it, they have a different language, which means that they have a different culture as well. And that is why, because we have to reach them with, by speaking another language, we say missions. Therefore, the deaf missions is also referred to as unreached people group missions. And the field of deaf ministry is indeed both a golden fishing ground and an empty place. And missionary Jung, Juan Jung, who's my son, who had been working with a local deaf community in Palawan, Philippines, he speaks sign language or English sign language very fluently because when he was young, there was an elder who came to our church who's now in, who's serving as a layman missionary right now in Malawi, but And he knew that my son was deaf. And we had not even thought about this. And, you know, we didn't have the leisure to do that. We were only so concentrated on our ministry. But that elder said, oh, pastor, I'll take your son to America. And what that meant was that because in America, you, you know, they don't really consider deaf being a great disability. So I'll take your son to America and give him and have him get an education there. And so he, and so he, he took care of my son in middle for three years of his middle school. In middle school, he went. He, my son had gone to school in elementary school, middle school, and in and even his university in America. And he graduated from Gallaudet University, which is the world's first university for the deaf. And many of their alumni are scattered all over the world. And so there was nothing I did for, for my son, but God, through Elder Ko, how, there's no elder like that, but that elder, he, with his own expense, from all the flights to even to to with even he even took my wife and my mother-in-law and explained everything about what it took for the ed, for uh, what they needed to do and what education my son was going to be re receiving and provided for my son that way and my son also studied in Japan so he he speaks English sign language as well as Japanese sign language so he's able to communicate with with many 
And so utilizing this network, we will discover hidden disciples and minister to English-speaking deaf individuals both domestically and internationally. God's work is truly amazing. Because through my son's hearing impairment, it's evident that God continues to expand the tent of my ministries. And so if it wasn't for my son, my son's diagnosis, I probably was never an individual who would have never done ministry, but that's how God worked. And so that's what God worked so that we may first establish a deaf church. But what was important is that is not what is important is that that I came before Jesus. And even if it doesn't really align with me and I don't really necessarily agree with it, God continues to God, God continued to urge me to do what he desired and I had to discard of myself because if not I, it, I couldn't do it therefore may all members and believers of Yemen church may you go before Jesus if you give one proper and correct worship all answers will come forth may this be a worship that brings answers I bless in the name of the Lord that all believers of Yemen church may realistically experience Jesus the answer to all life's problem and be a testament to raising the eternal watchtower of Christ in the field of life Point number two, the faith of being with Jesus. Verse 24 reads, And he went with him, and a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. Jesus saw in Jairus a faith that was certain Jesus would clearly resolve his issue. And Jesus went with him. He saw the faith that Jairus had. There's something important to notice here. It's a faith of being with Jesus. That is what a faith that Jesus desires. And so, and with that faith, you embrace the mystery of with Emmanuel oneness. And when you enjoy that, then problems no longer become a problem. Of course, problems do come. Various problems do come, but problems do not become a problem if you already become with Emmanuel in oneness. And this fact is vividly conveyed in today's scripture. On Jesus' way to Jairus' place, an incident occurs. Jesus cured the woman suffering from menorrhagia for 12 years. And because of that, there was a delay in his journey. And amidst that delay comes an unfortunate news. Mark chapter 5, verse 35 reads, While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? And so while Jesus was speaking, this person had come and had passed the news that his daughter had already passed away. And I'm sure the ruler might have been in speechless shock at that time. And he had just seen that how the woman suffering from menorrhagia was cured. Oh, seeing how Jesus heals that woman, my daughter will be healed as well. I'm sure he had that immense hope, but now he had heard that his daughter had died. To him who was filled with hope came a great desperate despair because his daughter had already passed. His daughter had already passed. How could, no matter, even if Jesus, even if it were Jesus, how could he save someone who had died? But at that time, this is when Jesus says to Jairus, verse 36, But over hearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. Do not fear, only believe. Only believe. In Greek is monon pistue, which is spoken in the present tense. This means that Jesus is asking Jairus to not be shaken as he holds to the faith that led to Jesus in the first place. Just have the sure confirmation and assurance. Then the grace of God is bound to come upon that faith. What this verse tells us is that Jesus, the sovereign of life, is the Christ, the solution to all things. And may we believe in that. Jesus is not merely one who performs miracles and heals illnesses, but we must raise the level of our faith to think 
and consider Jesus as the Christ who completely solved all of our problems. That began from Genesis chapter 3, the problems of sin, curses, Satan, and death. That's what Jesus demonstrated. He was divinely revealing and demonstrating that Jesus is God Himself who came in human form. He is the Creator and the Sovereign of life. That is what He was demonstrating. And then Jesus proves the fact in chapter 5, verses 38 to 42. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to him, What are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talithai kumai, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. Jesus held the hand of the death the dead child and said, Talitha kumi. This is, it is Aramaic, means, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. With his word, Jairus' 12-year-old daughter immediately woke up and walked as if she was never dead to begin with. It wasn't that she just woke up, but she walked, woke up and walked. With Jesus' word, death was completely cast out and life took place. May you believe. With Jesus' word, death was completely bound. It was cast out. It was completely driven out. And that's why faith is that important. When you receive grace, there is restoration. Life is revived. We must know that Jesus Christ is the sovereign of life, and He demonstrated that before the people. The Jesus Christ that we believe in is not just one of the many gods that secular religions speak of. He is the one and only true God. He is the God who has created all the universe, and He is God who is still with those who believe in Him. And when we are with Jesus, then nothing becomes a problem. Oh, Pastor, I have many concerns. Why do you have so many concerns? Oh, Pastor, I have so many problems. No, problems are not a problem. The problem is whether you have faith or not. Don't be so caught up with your thoughts and concerns. When I look at the choir, there are many those of them who, whose faces are so serious. Please. When people praise things, you, your facial expression should show you praising. But then people are all wrinkling their faces. You know, our conductor, you need to make sure that their faces, their faces should be as bright as angels who praise. As ones who, in whom all the problems have been liberated. If you're so seized and caught up by your problems, how can you give true praise? Even if you may have problems, May you become free of that the moment you worship. You have to enjoy and be freed and be healed. And so why are you so burdened by those problems? May you be truly free and liberated before God. This gospel that God gives us is so tremendous. There's one important thing that we have to know in today's passage. Jesus said that the child is not dead, but sleeping. And what was the response? It said, they laughed at him. Of course they would laugh at him. They saw how the child was dead. The child had taken its la her last breath, but Jesus said that she's sleeping. Of course people would laugh at him. And for a dead to come to life, that's nonsense. How could someone who had died come to life? However, this was their limited frame and perspective as mere creations. How could a dead come to life? Does it make sense that the child was sleeping? No, I'm sure that we both would have been laughing if we were there. But if Jesus is also the creator of life, then everything is possible. 
Of course, yes, it is true that it can't be true, but for the Creator, it is possible. And that's why Jesus was showing that He is the Creator, that He is the Master, the Lord of life. If it's not God, if Jesus was not God, this would have been impossible. You must properly understand what it means to be the Holy Trinity, because God is Jesus and Jesus is God. And so God in human form is Jesus. Why are you living such a self-centered life with a brain not even close to an IQ of 200? Why do you try to interpret things in your own level? Oh, I don't understand this. I can't, you know, I don't agree with this. Of course, you may not understand it. However, with the faith that believes in God, it is possible. You must not be deceived. When you come before God and live your walk of faith, and even as you are given positions, if you try to limit the church with your level, and you, in your, well, by your level, you may think, oh, no, that can't be. Is that so? That's your level. It's true. But if you're with God, it is possible. How, what is impossible? The Red Sea splitting? Liberal theologians say that that is impossible. How could it be that the Red Sea had split? Humans cannot split the sea. Yes, that's true. Yes, that may be true. But the Almighty Creator God, when it comes to Him, it's a different story. He is the one who created that sea to start with. Don't try to judge and assume and believe only what you can understand by your standard. As you pray and as you do your ministry, as you meet people, you must know this properly. And so if you try to live by your standards and based on your level, that's not faith. That is not a walk of faith. Jesus made all the crowd who laughed at him go outside. They missed their... They could have seen Jesus' miracle of Talitha Kumai, but they completely had lost that chance while they were laughing at him. And so Jesus does not show to those who laugh because for those who mock and laugh, they'll continue to mock and laugh. All ye one believers, may you co completely come out from such a posture of unbelief. A faith that is with Jesus is a faith that enables everything. I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. That's what he, it was said. Because there is Him who gives me strength, I can do all things. All young believers, may not be your standard, your level, but may you experience God's standard and scale. This is the conclusion. When you, in soccer, there's an expression called Hollywood action. A more specific description in English would be simulation action. And this res refers to the soccer player's attempt to deceive the referee to draw a favorable decision. And so usually this happens inside the penalty, penalty box because if such offense is made in that penalty box, they can receive a penalty kick. But then if it's intentionally, if that's intended intentionally, then they could even be ejected from the field. But speaking of this, once again, reminds me of the recent Asian Cup tournament and starts to frustrate me a little bit again. But there was one player who made such Hollywood action and received a warning. But it's because this is something that infringes on sportsmanship because they're faking it and trying to deceive the referee to draw favorable action. But there are times when we live with such misconceptions in our walks of faith. Someone can seem so devout and faithful in the eyes of man, but in the eyes of God, that individual is simply acting out of Hollywood action. It may seem like that individual has good faith, but in the eyes of God, it's not true. Perhaps one can deceive the eyes of man, but one can never deceive God. May you remember that God desires our faith in its entirety. Do not fear, only believe. Amen? Do not fear, only believe. 
I bless all Yewon believers in the name of the Lord that you may have the faith to come before Jesus who has the power of resurrection and the faith of being with Jesus. And with that, may you enlarge your physical and spiritual tents and have the evidence of change and growth in your fields. Let us pray. Father God, may all believers of Yewon Church have the faith to come before Jesus first. And may they remember that it, as long as they are with Jesus, that nothing is impossible. And may they live a walk of faith that is with God. We pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.